Good almost afternoon. Um, welcome. I'm Karen Engel, co-director of the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. And I'm really excited um, to welcome you to this event today entitled Personal <laughs> Injury Law and International Human Rights Litigating Toxic Injustices. Um, we're presenting this with the William Wayne Justice Center for Public Interest Law. And thank you very much, Mary, for Crowder, for all of your work on that. Um, and it's also co-sponsored by the Environmental Law Society, the Human Rights Law Society, and the Public Interest Law Association. And I think it will become clear why all of these groups um, are participating in this um, as we move forward. Um, I want to say this has been a long time in coming. Um, I'm very excited about it. I've been talking with Scott Hindler um, for quite some time about um, the work that he does and the way in the, its importance for our students to know about, um, and faculty as well, and staff and everyone, but thinking about really um, what are the different kinds of ways in which people can build um, public interest work into careers that's not necessarily only about public law. So I think in human rights we focus on public law a lot, um, a lot of public interest law, um, is focused on public law um, and environmental law. We think about public regulation. Um, so Scott really will bring to our attention with Natalie uh, Davidson, who you'll meet as well in a moment, um, the ways in which private law is very important, not only in structuring really the background rules against which public law operates, um, but it's a very important space for contestation and possible change. Um, so. I'll just introduce briefly uh, Scott to you. You'll learn a lot more about him. Um, today's format is an interview, so I'll also introduce our interviewer, um, Natalie Davidson. And uh, the idea is that uh, Natalie will interview Scott for about half an hour, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so Scott Hendler is founding member um, of the law firm Hendler Lyons Flores, um, which is here in Austin, Texas. Um, he represents individuals and their families throughout, um, well, the United States, but also uh, the hemisphere, um, who have suffered damages from exposure to asbestos and other toxins, including DBCP, which you'll hear a lot about today, um, dangerous pharmaceuticals and medical devices, and other catastrophic injuries. Um, Scott's won precedent setting decisions before the U.S. Supreme Court, as well as the state Supreme Courts of Hawaii and Delaware. Um, he's long had an interest in international human rights law, um, which is how we connected. Um, indeed, even before Scott went to law school, um, he was in Costa Rica and he convinced the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to establish an internship for him um, in 1983. And that internship, um, Many of us have benefited from. I benefited from it four years later um, when I, after my first year of law school, and had no idea um, that Scott had been so instrumental um, in creating it. So um, he's always out there looking for opportunities and then making sure they get passed along. So I'm grateful to Scott for that. Um, and uh, while Scott was at the court, um, he also found a mentor there, Charles Moyer, um, who was secretary of the court at the time. Um, is at the Inter-American Institute of Human Rights now. Um, and the Rappaport Center and several UT law students have benefited from that relationship as well, um, as Scott generously established the Charles Moyer Summer Fellowship in Human Rights um, as a tribute to his mentor. Um, and uh, basically those funds uh, for the last three years have gone to support um, students working in human rights law through the summer, so we also thank you for that. Um, so Scott will be interviewed uh, today by Natalie Davidson, who's a visiting fellow at the Rappaport Center this year, um, and it's been great to have her around. Um, she's completing her PhD in law at the University of Tel Aviv, um, writing about the U.S. alien tort, um, uh, tort statute, statute. I, I was <laughs> going to give her the old name, uh, the alien tort statute, and particularly looking at cases um, regarding Paraguay and the Philippines. Um, and she's really, uh, her dissertation is focused on that. She's doing some path-breaking work. Um, and so some of her future project, or one of her future projects, is to think about um, the role of tort law in human rights. So 
when she was hanging around uh, this year, we started talking, and I said, you've got to meet Scott Hendler. You all have a lot in common. And I mentioned um, a little bit more about his work with banana uh, plantation workers. And she said, oh, I've read a book about that. Um, and the book, which I saw Scott brought, um, is by an historian, Susanna rankin Bohm, um, And it's called Toxic Injustice, um, A Transnational History of Exposure and Struggle. Um, so uh, Scott is, um, uh, well, the case is prominent in the book, and he is in the book as well. Um, and we thought that um, sort of to be able to get at the variety of issues and work that Scott's done, we thought we would do things a little bit differently by having this interview format, um, which means that not only will Natalie ask him the questions, but as I said, you all will have a chance mm -hmm. as well. So with that, um, I turn it over to Natalie. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Scott, for being here today and also for agreeing to this unorthodox interview <laughs> format. Um, we thought a conversational style uh, might be helpful to get in depth and also make accessible to a large audience what is really a very long and complicated and technical uh, story. So you're all welcome to come up afterwards and tell us what you thought of that format. Um, so. Over the course of your career, Scott, you've been involved, as Karen said, in many different types of cases than, that one would categorize as public interest. Um, and we will talk a bit about um, other cases in your career. And I'm sure law students will have a lot of questions about how one can manage or even survive doing public interest law in private practice. Um, but right now, for this um, portion of the event, we wanted to focus in particular on the DBCP cases. Um, because they, they really bring up some issues that have been of interest to the Rappaport Center this year about corporate and north-south accountability and relations. And they should also be of interest to um, different members of the audience here because we not only have law students, faculty, and practitioners um, in the audience, we also have graduate students from various disciplines including sociology, urban planning. We have undergraduates here interested in environmental justice and others who I'm probably not aware of. So um, these cases really bring all these different issues together in quite a fascinating way. So before talking about the lawsuits themselves, could you give us a bit of background? What is DBCP? Who manufactured it? Who used it? And what does it do? Well, thank you, Natalie and Karen. Thank you for having me. Uh, let me just take a second to introduce my law partners, Sean Lyons and Rebecca Weber, who are here and have played an a instrumental role in the litigation you're going to hear about. And one of our uh, uh, non-lawyer legal professionals, Alexis Lopez, is here with us also. Um, DBCP is the acronym for dibromochloropropane. And it was developed in uh, probably 1951 by the Pineapple Research Institute in Hawaii. The Pineapple Research Institute in Hawaii was really a trade organization owned and operated by Dole and Del Monte. Uh, they were really the two 800-pound gorillas. And then, you know, they had paid lip service to other smaller farmers that could belong. But the executives who ran the trade association were on a revolving door with these two large multinational fruit growers. And they developed this pesticide uh, to kill uh, microscopic worms that attack the roots of fruit plants called nematodes. And they do a lot of damage to the crop. Um, uh, you know, the, the pesticide was very effective in uh, controlling that, but it also was causing uh, uh, at least in animal studies, animals to become sterile. And nevertheless, they uh, enlisted the help of Dow and Shell in the mid-50s to uh, produce it on a commercial basis for pineapple. And then in the early 60s, they got the idea that you know, if it works on pineapple, it's going to work on bananas. And of course, Del Monte and Dole uh, uh, had, well, it was really becoming Castle and Cook. And Castle and Cook had the Dole brand. Castle and Cook was from Hawaii. Uh, they also bought a banana company based out of New Orleans called Standard Fruit. Standard Fruit then uh, has all been absorbed into the Dole company now. 
uh, over the last several decades. But they started using it in trials in Costa Rica in 1965, and they would apply it uh, differently in the banana plantations than they did in the pineapple plantations. And in the pineapple plantations, they, they had a contraption on the back of a tractor that had like a, it was like a, a rake almost, and it injected the chemical into the ground as the tractor drove over the fields. Because if you've, I don't know if you've ever been to a pineapple field or not, but you know, pineapples just grow out of the ground yay high, maybe a foot or so. And so the tractor can, can get through the uh, rows. Banana plantations are a whole different ball of wax. Um, and so what they developed was an injector. The injector looks like, if you've ever seen a lifeguard at the beach with what's called a torpedo buoy, the orange buoys that they then strap over their chest and they have to rescue somebody, they take that in the water with them. Uh, that's what the injector looked like, except it had, a, it had two handles coming out of the top, it had a plunger, and it had about an 18-inch spike with a foot pedal. And labor was so cheap in uh, these developing nations on the banana plantations, uh, they just enlisted men to in hand inject the chemical around every single banana plant. Uh, and there was usually four injections around the plant. I mean, it just takes a massive number of laborers to do this. If you've ever been uh, to some of the banana fields in either Costa Rica uh, or even Ecuador, you can drive for hours and see nothing but banana plantations. And there were you know, tens of thousands of men working in the industry in each country at any given moment because of the, the amount of labor involved in uh, managing the, the growing process, whether it's uh, applying the, the pesticide or uh, cultivating the fruit or, or whatever it may be. What happened in the banana plantations that was a bit different from what happened in the pineapple fields is the pineapple fields were really open and so the fumes both were injected into the ground so that reduced the exposure to the the tractor drivers and some of the workers and it dissipated easier so there are less cases of, of health issues in in Hawaii although there are some if you've ever been to a restaurant and you've got you've ordered fish wrapped in a banana leaf it's steamed in a banana leaf, and the reason they can do that is because the banana leaf is permeable. And that's what happened on this, on this just exponential scale. The banana leaves created this, um, like a steam room almost, the humidity in the banana plantations in Ecuador and Costa Rica and Panama um, was you know, every bit as hot or hotter than it gets in Austin, Texas in the summer, or Houston or New Orleans. But you're covered with these giant impermeable leaves that are trapping the fumes that are released from the injection process. And it's not just the injection process. They're filling these containers with it. So it's spilling on the ground, and that's releasing fumes. It's spilling on their body, and it's getting through their skin. Um, you know, there were reports of men who would go home at night, and they could smell the chemical in their urine. That's how powerful the, the exposures were. Um, so fast forward about 1983, and I'll, I'll try to wrap this up so you can get on to your questions, but fast forward 1983, you know, there's a, a legendary lawyer in Texas by the name of Fred Barron was approached about bringing these cases on behalf of a group of Costa Rican banana plantation workers. The, the workers, uh, uh, some doctors in the banana plantation communities began to identify large numbers of men who were turning up sterile. And uh, one of them had a sister who was a lawyer in Costa Rica, and she called the lawyer in California. That lawyer called Fred Barron, and that's how the litigation began. But what happened a little earlier, in 1977, uh, Dow, Shell, and now Occidental were formulating this chemical. Occidental was formulating it under a license to Dow. And uh, the, the men who were the formulators, who actually worked in the manufacturing facility, mixing the chemical and formulating it, uh, played on a softball team together. 
and their wives would go and watch the game. And the wives got to talking, and they were all, you know, childbearing age, and they, none of them were able to get pregnant. So, sorry, this, Scott, can you say where this was? Where this the this was, was in, in Lathrop, California, is where this happened. They just started comparing notes. And they realized that the one thing in common is all the men they were trying to get pregnant with worked at this plant. So they were members of the uh, uh, OCAW, which is a union, Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. They brought OSHA in. OSHA is young, five years old, six years old at this time, 1977. But it was an example of <coughs> government really responding very well. They shut down the formulation plant within days. They uh, stopped use of the chemical around the country. There were all these emergency standards. And they figured out very quickly that that was the problem. Uh, between 77 and 79, Dow and Occidental and Shell continued to ship it abroad, even though they couldn't use it domestically, except uh, in Hawaii. The Hawaiian uh, pineapple industry had enough political stroke to get an exemption for pineapple. So it was being used in pineapple, and then it was being exported to these countries. Uh, there was a big two-year regulatory fight over whether to allow the, the chemical to be used under certain conditions. And the EPA got involved, and they finally decided, look, there's, there's no safe level of this stuff. You can't use it safely. It's not possible. And so they canceled the registration of the chemical. That doesn't happen very often. Um, nevertheless, they, kept, they had huge stocks. Dole especially had huge stocks in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and Costa Rica was a little more developed. Uh, their, their systems, their, their governmental regulatory systems were a little more developed than places like Honduras or Ecuador, for example, in 1979. Um, and so they uh, began the process to cancel the, the registration or the equivalent of that in Costa Rica at about that time. That took a few years, but in the interim, Dole shipped it to Honduras and then shipped it to Ecuador. And so they continued to use vast amounts of it uh, on their plantations in Honduras, Nicaragua, uh, Costa Rica, until Costa Rica stopped the use of it, I think, in 1985, uh, and especially in Ecuador and Panama. And so, so that's kind of the thank you. So tell, overview. tell us about the lawsuits. Who were they against, and how did you get involved? So, so this small group of workers and their Costa Rican lawyer find their way to Fred Barron in Dallas, Texas, 1983, and he decides to bring a case um, in Florida called Sibaha. Uh, and it was uh, summarily dismissed under the doctrine of form nonconvenience, but there was never a record made on the form nonconvenience issues, whether there was an alternative available, alternative forum, was the form adequate, and so forth. Okay, sorry, Scott, can you just explain for the non-lawyers in the room oh, what that doctrine yeah, yeah. is? So form nonconvenience is it's a, it's a Latin term. It's a legal doctrine, which means that even if jurisdiction is proper where you bring the lawsuit, a judge has the discretion to send that case to another jurisdiction by way of dismissing it under this doctrine. And the, uh, the, the framework of analysis is really, first, is there another available forum where the defendants would be subject to jurisdiction, number one? And number two, if there is, is that forum adequate? And the fight has been over those two issues for 30 years. Um, uh, so they get dismissed in, in Florida, the 11th Circuit affirms it in Sibaha, and then they, they turn their attention to bringing the cases in Texas. And so in 1985, they filed uh, the Alfaro case. Uh, Domingo Alfaro was a banana worker from Costa Rica, very, very impressive guy, uh, who had uh, worked as a young man uh, with the chemical, was sterile, and um, uh, they brought suit. Texas State Court. That culminated in a Texas Supreme Court decision called Domingo Alfaro versus Shell. The Texas courts had dismissed it for form nonconvenience, but in a 5-4 decision with uh, uh, Lloyd Doggett was on the court at the time, and he was the deciding factor, uh, ruled that for the doctrine was not recognized under Texas law. 
because there were uh, treaties between the United States and some of these countries, Costa Rica in particular, uh, called Treaties of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation. And these, these treaties provided what have been commonly referred to as equal treaty rights between citizens of those nations so that they are entitled to the same treatment in the courts of those countries when they're there to redress wrongs and injuries and damages and so forth. And that issue made its way to the Texas Supreme Court. Texas Supreme Court ruled that in the case of equal treaty rights, form of nonconvenience is not a recognized doctrine under Texas law. So uh, that was 1990 and Texas was just undergoing a shift in its political orientation. Um, and they quickly uh, passed uh, a statute, a form of convenience statute in Texas. I think it's 71051 or something like that. I forget the exact number. But it basically adopted the framework for uh, the courts <laughs> to dismiss cases under uh, that, uh, that doctrine, that legal framework. Now, it, it, it took place, uh, it passed in 1993 at the legislative session, and it wasn't going to take effect until September of 1993, and it was only going to be prospective, which means it only would apply to, to cases after the date it became effective. It didn't apply to anything that got filed before that. So in August of 1993, a large class action was filed in state court in Texas and Brazoria County against Dow, Dole, Shell, um, Occidental, uh, and Del, uh, Del Monte um, uh, on this basis. <clears throat> the defendants removed claiming fraudulent joinder, I think, of Shell Oil Company, who was one of the manufacturers. That got remanded very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the court in Brazoria County was about to rule on the class certification motion uh, the next day. Uh, and the night before, the defendants came up with an idea to, to try and get federal jurisdiction because federal courts were not bound by the Texas Supreme Court ruling that form nonconvenience was not uh, available to the Texas courts because it was considered procedural. So the federal courts followed their own f federal procedure. The defendants third-partied in very, very surreptitiously Israeli chemical companies called the Dead Sea Chemical Company. I swear I'm not making this up. And they, uh, uh, and the Dead Sea Chemical Company removed the case to federal court. That triggered a 10-year odyssey through the federal courts that culminated uh, and, and I don't want to bog down, but it culminated in a Supreme Court decision in 2003 that uh, I and my co-counsel Jonathan Massey won 9-0 to zero in the Supreme Court, ordering the cases remanded to uh, state court. Now, by now, we had opened a front in Hawaii, so there, these cases were in Hawaii. Um, uh, and so that's where we were. We were in Hawaii, then the cases were, dis there was now new issues about statute of limitations and class action tolling. And so that then resulted <laughs> in a, another 10-year fight uh, that went to the Hawaii Supreme Court and my law partner Sean Lyons uh, uh, very artfully argued it and my partner Rebecca Weber was the key drafter of the brief uh, and we won that case uh, last fall uh, uh, unanimously. So it restored, uh, by this time there were only about three or four plaintiffs who were still involved in the Hawaii litigation. Okay. And it also, just the last thing I will tell you then, the, the litigation then moved into uh, Louisiana because uh, Standard Fruit had been there and that's where so much of this came together. Uh, and for s several strategic reasons, which I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, we also filed the cases in Delaware. And uh, in the interim, so we won We've won in the Supreme Court of Delaware on class action tolling. We've just won in Hawaii Supreme Court. And last week, uh, or I guess two weeks ago, uh, Jonathan Massey and I argued to an en banc court of the Third Circuit on this issue. So it's like Lazarus. It just keeps rising from the ashes. So tell us, when you are working on these cases, do you, 
Have you collaborated with uh, local lawyers, local organizations in Costa Rica, in other Central American countries that your clients are coming from? Well, a, lo a lot of other lawyers who initially were involved in this litigation did, you know, took a traditional approach of contacting uh, lawyers in these foreign countries and explaining the litigation to them and encouraging them to uh, develop business, sign up clients, however they went about signing up clients in these countries. Um, uh, and, and those people then had real built-in financial incentives to get as many people as they could to not necessarily uh, look at the merits of the individual workers' claims and so forth. I took a little different approach and I reached out to, uh, through a very intricate networking process, uh, found some, uh, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, to work with in Ecuador, who, um, <clears throat> and at the same time I was working with the AFL-CIO. I went to the International Convention, which is held every two years. It was in San Francisco, I think, in 1994. And, uh, you know, I was in my early 30s, and I sat down in the bar with a group of these old men who were there, it turned out to be the president of AFL-CIO and the vice president of AFL-CIO and the, you know, the, the, the treasurer, and it was all the uh, executive committee, and I started telling them what I was doing. And so they put me in touch with the people who are running their Latin American labor organiz organization operation. Uh, a very controversial group called A-Field, which is for another time. But they introduced me to local union leaders in Panama and Ecuador. And at about that time, a group of human rights lawyers from Costa Rica reached out to me because they learned that A, I had been involved in the initial round of litigation that Fred Barron had handled, which by the way, he settled. There were a thousand workers. He managed to negotiate a great settlement uh, for those workers, but then decided that this was not the kind of litigation he wanted to continue to do. And, and got out of it, and, uh, and that's where I saw an opportunity to, to get involved. Because by that time, I had been working with Fred Barron, and I had the great fortune and, and uh, uh, honor to work very closely with him. I was really became his lawyer, and I was able to travel around Costa Rica and Canada and New York, and wherever we went, we were working on these cases. And so uh, I learned a great deal from him and about this litigation. So. How has your relationship been with these local NGOs and labor <coughs> organizations? Well, it, I think it's been a very effective uh, strategy for um, developing relationships with workers. There, there's a lot more credibility, I think, that is a, uh, associated with groups that don't have a financial incentive. So they're not going to get paid if we win. You know, we, we hired them and we uh, you know, funded their operations uh, to the extent they were helping us educate workers. So union leaders would invite me in to come and talk to their membership about the litigation, how, it could, how the class litigation could affect their rights and uh, what their options were. And they, the union leaders encouraged their workers to retain my law firm uh, <clears throat> simply to protect their rights and their interests. And so that's how my client base developed. And the same thing happened with these human rights organizations in Costa Rica who, uh, you know, didn't want to deal with the, the lawyers in Costa Rica who were handling this because they had really become just preoccupied with the money that was at issue. So the victim organizations and the labor unions in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and I think some <coughs> of the other countries uh, that the victims came from lobbied their governments and their parliaments for measures for legislation that would enable them to get compensation either from the state or um, from the corporations themselves. Were you involved in any of that? Was this a parallel strategy? Were you, was there any coordination? Y yes. I mean, that came about as a result of the, the federal court in Houston when the case got removed with the Israeli companies and so forth. So, I mean, it took 10 years for the Supreme Court to rule on whether that removal, that transfer from state court to federal court was proper. But in the meantime, uh, the federal judge who had been 
fortunately for the defendants, the former law partner, the lead lawyer for Chiquita in the litigation, uh, entered uh, <coughs> a sweeping decision, 50-page decision, called Delgado uh, versus Dow, Delgado versus Shell. I can never remember which it is. Um, dismissing the cases on form not convenience and going through a very detailed analysis. By this time, we had made a very careful record uh, 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 and developed a lot of evidence about the difference between the law on the books in civil code nations and the law in practice. And the law on the books, the, the, the civil code provisions might provide a remedy on paper, but in practice, the courts did not have the systems the, in place, the experience, uh, they just didn't have the capacity to deal with large numbers of personal injury plaintiffs. They had never seen anything like this before. And so uh, the, the judge said, <clears throat> look, if the foreign courts decline to exercise jurisdiction in the case, you can bring the cases back. And, and I'll keep the case open. And uh, if the courts, <clears throat> if the highest court of the country declines jurisdiction, then I'll resume prosecution so, of the so case. So we're talking about the highest court in Nicaragua, the highest court That's in right. Costa Rica. That's right. <coughs> and, so go back there and, and so one of the things we did is we, we worked with lawyers there to help draft legislation uh, that, would be, that would really explain how their civil code provisions worked. Because the, the federal judge just wasn't buying it or he, he, just, he didn't really want to hear anything he didn't want to hear about how the, how the code provisions worked. Because in for the law students in the room. The venue, you know, is where you can bring a lawsuit and, and where it's proper to bring a lawsuit. So in Texas, uh, there are two or three places. You can sue where the defendant resides. You can sue where the injury occurred. Um, uh, and once you do that, the court can then say, well, you sued where the injury occurred, but I really think it ought to be uh, brought where the defendant resides. So I'm transferring it under this venue statute. Okay, they have that flexibility. In Napoleonic code systems, they don't have that flexibility. They establish two places. You can bring it where the defendant's domiciled or the injury occurred. And once a plaintiff elects one or the other, that becomes inviolate. That's their right. Court cannot disturb it. And so that really set uh, the Napoleonic code systems on a collision course with the common law systems in the United States. The federal judge is saying, well, no foreign court, is, your foreign country is going to tell me whether I can dismiss a case on forum nonconvenience, except the problem with that reasoning is that forum nonconvenience requires there to be an available forum. And, the court, and so the, the foreign courts or the foreign countries had laws on the book that said, once our citizens elect a, uh, a venue, if, if they elect where the defendant's domiciled, we can't take jurisdiction of it. And so we had to pass statutes that kind of made that plain and simple for the courts. Uh, we did that in uh, Nicaragua. We did that in Panama. We did it in Guatemala. We did it in Ecuador uh, with different degrees of success. What, what happened in, um, in Costa Rica, it got bogged down, but the case went up to the, the Costa Rican Supreme Court who issued uh, a very <coughs> important decision called Abarca saying that basically what we were telling the courts, look, once our citizens elect where to bring suit, they cannot be forced to change that election. And so we're not taking jurisdiction. So that we brought the cases back to the United States. By this time, it was 2004. Um, in Nicaragua, what was going on is we, we helped draft a, 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 what I thought was a pretty reasonable law. and. Uh, and, and, you know, when I say we, I mean, there were a lot of people involved. Charles Siegel, who is a partner at Waters and Krauss firm in Dallas, a brilliant appellate lawyer, was very involved. Uh, Fred Misko, who has since died, uh, was a great plaintiff's lawyer in Dallas. Sussman Godfrey was involved with uh, Siegel and Misko. Um, I was involved, a firm out of South Carolina called, at the time, Ness Motley was involved. So there were a lot of people involved in doing all this. I wasn't the only person doing it. But we drafted a law in Nicaragua, and uh, uh, at that time, Daniel Ortega of Sandinista fame was now a senator in the Democratic country. 
and he took up the cause. And he looked at the law and he said, well, if this is good, something much stronger is better. And he drafted a law called Special Law 364. And that law uh, w w was basically plaintiff wins. You know, the, plain, the, plaintiff, the, plaintiff, <laughs> the plaintiff brings a suit and claims injury from DBCP. They have created a rebuttable presumption that they were injured by DBCP. The defendant can respond by posting a bond of $100,000 for each worker that's brought this suit. And so that then, and I didn't, I didn't get involved in Nicaragua after that. I didn't have any cases from Nicaragua or anything. But lawyers from around the United States and lawyers in Nicaragua started scrambling and signing up more people than I think pr could have worked in the banana plantation in Nicaragua. <laughs> Um, claiming injuries because, you know, the, the truth is that's sort of how the law works in Texas, but for defendants. It's the other way around, <laughs> you know. So it's not really, it's not like there's no precedent for it. Um, uh, but the, the, the cases went through the courts of Nicaragua. Uh, there were huge judgments issued by the trial courts. They went on appeal, took many years. Dole tried to get Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State at the time, to weigh in and pressure the Nicaraguan government to abandon the law and so forth uh, to no avail. And eventually, the Nicaraguan Supreme Court upheld the judgments of about a billion dollars of you know, thousands of workers. Um, and then the lawyers who had kind of scrambled to get into this and really didn't have an historical perspective of the litigation or, in my opinion, a full appreciation of all the legal issues. Um, then brought those judgments to the United States and thought they would get them enforced. And what they found was that the federal courts were, were reluctant to do it and essentially ruled that uh, Nicaragua failed to adhere to international standards of due process with this law, and so they weren't going to enforce a judgment. So they're now running around the world, uh, literally, trying to get these judgments enforced. Canada, Spain, Venezuela. Uh, um, and a number of other places. And I kind of lost track of where that is. I, there's a lawyer from Nicaragua who calls me periodically pleading with me to take this on, but I, I keep dodging his phone calls. So, 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 um, so you obviously work through close collaboration with these local organizations, even you know, in their work lobbying for legislation. Did you nevertheless experience conflicts or disagreements with the clients for cultural or other reasons? Well, I mean, I think I enjoyed a lot of credibility that a lot of the law firms didn't because I went down myself. I uh, spoke enough Spanish to talk to them at large assemblies and discuss the issues. And I was there in person, whereas you know, a lot of these firms sent surrogates and people who weren't really accountable. Um, and we were, we were, our group of clients, which ended up totaling at one time about 3,000 from four different countries, were um, really trying to shake things up. They were trying to challenge the status quo because the bigger firms were, you know, had brought 25,000 cases and they were just, you know, dismissing cases without consulting the clients and just kind of trading these cases like commodities, really. Um, and so I think there was a lot of, um, uh, you, you know, there was a sense of unification. Uh, but, you know, in Latin America, particularly in the socioeconomic classes of workers who tend to work in banana plantations, um, there, is, there is this uh, cultural tendency to be very suspicious of, especially of someone like a lawyer's motives. And so someone would start a rumor and say, oh, the lawyer settled the cases and kept all the money. And then everybody would say, oh, the lawyer settled the cases and kept all the money. And then you'd have to come down and you have to talk to them and explain why that didn't happen, couldn't happen, wouldn't happen, and so forth. Um, so there were those issues, and those you know flare up from time to time. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know Dole has you know, played a role of some sort in kind of seeding some of that, but. Um, I know that d the victims associate a range of health problems with DBCP, not just infertility. <coughs> Were these lawsuits only about infertility 
Were there any disagreements about that? Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> that was another issue that was a real challenge to try to educate workers about because the perception was that DBCP was this, you know, evil chemical and any health problem they had must have been caused by DBCP. Their feet ached. They had arthritis. It must have been DBCP. Their back ached. Their head ached. Their, um, uh, they had indigestion. They had, you know, any kind of uh, malady they wanted to attribute to it. And what, you know, we can only prove certain things with medical science in our courts, and so we had to be very rigid in the criteria of the types of cases we would handle. Um, the other thing was that many women felt that they had been harmed by it. And the fact is they may very well have been harmed by it. But it was just really complicated to try and prove it. So a woman might have multiple miscarriages and have exposure, but uh, women have multiple miscarriages without exposure. So it would be really difficult to bring those cases in U.S. courts and then meet the standards of evidence or the evidentiary standards we had to meet uh, to prove those cases. And so we made a deliberate decision that we couldn't take those cases on. We couldn't afford it. We didn't have the capacity. We didn't have the resources. And we took on cases of, of male infertility. We also took on cases where people had you know, cornea damage, which it was documented to cause, uh, severe chronic skin disorders and rashes that was uh, caused. Um, uh, but there was a lot of pushback, a lot of anger among um, uh, female worker populations that we did not believe we could, we could prevail on those cases. So my last question, and then we'll open the floor. Uh, your income from these cases derives, I presume, from the contingency fee. Um, and these cases, as, you, as you've told us, have been going on for close to three decades now. So how does one do it financially? So did I, you mentioned income. Did I tell you about the Supreme Court decisions I won? You know, <laughs> um, we, we haven't seen any income from these cases. Uh, and so um, there were the strategies that I employed in doing it was uh, forging partnerships, strategic partnerships with bigger firms that had uh, extensive resources and that wanted to get involved in it but uh, didn't really have somebody like me who could help navigate uh, the litigation or the culture or the areas where these cases were being brought. So we forged partnerships. Um, uh, and then I, I developed a practice in other sort of similar areas that were aligned with this kind of toxic exposure. So I do a lot of asbestos disease work around the United States because I learned that when I was working with Fred Barron and I just carried that on. Uh, you know, we then started taking those core competencies that we developed, we as a law firm is who I mean, uh, in asbestos litigation and applied it to other kinds of, uh, um, you know, chemical related injuries, whether it's from pharmaceutical drugs or, you know, metal coming off of a, a, a metal on metal hip implant or, uh, you know, an I IVC filter device, things like that. Um, and those cases have uh, helped to fund our law practice over the last couple of decades uh, that has allowed us to remain viable in this litigation. But it's really been just a 20 year odyssey of legal arguments. Mm -hmm. And once we get, uh, you know, once and if, if we ever get to a trial on the merits, then it'll be a very expensive trial. Uh, but I think that the uh, potential damages will be significant. Okay, well, I have many other questions, but let's open the floor. Um, we have a mic here. Uh, Selma will pass it around. <coughs> Anybody wants to? I will tell you, this is, you know, to call this the abridged version is an <laughs> underestimate. I mean, it's such a complicated uh, procedural history that we could probably teach a seminar about federal procedure just using this case. It really is very, very complicated. Do we have one question here? Scott, thank you for yeah. the wonderful talk. Uh, I just have a question. I mean, judging by what had happened to some of the people that have actually taken that fight on, uh, you know, and again, we were 
talking earlier about the law of the jungle book and, and, and the case uh, against Texaco in uh, Ecuador. I mean, a lot of people involved in this fight, they get, uh, I guess, th there is a campaign to smear, you know, the reputation. There, I mean, have you found that in this practice you have been the target, you know, of these smear campaigns? Had that created problems for you when you're trying to develop, you know, your uh, you know, businesses in other areas, then then also keep your your firm afloat because it seems like uh, they can be because these cases are so expensive. I mean, this case in Ecuador was 28 billion dollars. I mean, companies don't take it lightly. They invest a lot of resources. They have probably uh, you know PR firms that will probably be dedicated just to assassinate your character. So I'm wondering, how do you deal with that, and 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 have you encountered that? Well, you know, I really hate it when a company won't just roll over on a $28 billion judgment. But um, it, is a, it is a problem. It's a very good question. In fact, I'm, I'm giving a talk about that very issue uh, at an ABA conference uh, the beginning of April. Um, there has been a troubling um, uh, trend uh, among certain corporate defendants and, and their select law firms where they're faced with potentially troubling litigation like DBCP, which, you know, their defenses are all procedural. Once they get into a courtroom, they're going to have a hard time explaining their conduct. Uh, um, the Texaco Ecuador litigation, the same thing. Um, they, they decided to attack the lawyers, the plaintiff's lawyers who brought the case. And they, they ran a, they really did a dry rehearsal. Uh, in, in the DBCP litigation that was unfolding in California with a, another group of lawyers, of plaintiffs out of Nicaragua, and attacked the lawyers, accused them of fraud, uh, found a witness who they insisted they weren't bribing, but they conceded in a Wall Street Journal article that yes, they moved him from Nicaragua to Costa Rica. They built him a new home. They increased his salary from $150 a month to $1,500 a month. But that had nothing to do with the testimony that he was providing to them. And this single witness uh, you know, spun this story of fraud and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and how the lawyers were coaching plaintiffs to testify. And again, I, I wasn't part of that. Um, and wasn't a direct target of it, but it was a dry run to attempt to undermine the litigation uh, generally. And so when, when I uh, had cases in, in Hawaii, the same lawyers who had successfully derailed the cases in California this way came to uh, move for admission uh, under something called Pro Hoc Vice for that particular case. Um, and it's, it's unheard of to challenge uh, a lawyer's request to uh, be admitted to represent a client for a particular case. But in this case, I made an exception. And I challenged their motion by documenting what they had done over a 10-year period of attacking the lawyers instead of defending the litigation. And uh, it was a real shot across their bow. The court almost denied their admission, which would have been a catastrophic failure for their client relationship with Dole. And I think it really reined them in uh, from what they were doing. They're the same firm that has orchestrated this attack on the lawyer that, that uh, brought uh, the Ecuador litigation. So their dry run was against the banana worker litigation, and then they really unfolded their uh, piece their resistance in, uh, in the Ecuador litigation. Uh, and so that's a troubling trend. That's happened in asbestos litigation recently. A defendant who filed for bankruptcy called Garlock uh, brought uh, RICO actions against lawyers who had obtained verdicts against them in trials, uh, alleging that they deliberately Inspired to force him into bankruptcy by pursuing the uh, the verdicts. I mean, it's just uh, it, it's a troubling trend because what will happen is that eventually the plaintiffs' lawyers will start fighting fire with fire, and we're a lot better at that 
than they are. Um, and in fact, there was a case out of the Third Circuit about 18 months ago, uh, which in my opinion really was justified. A, a, an asbestos defendant for many, many years had in fact conspired with their law firm to conceal evidence uh, and then had the law firm threaten uh, lawsuits against everybody who brought claims against their company uh, if they did, weren't dismissed. And they were eventually dismissed and then uh, uh, they said they had no documents, they never used asbestos in their product and so forth. And then one day, the daughter of a man who had worked in their lab developed mesothelioma. And so the, the lawyer who represented was a very good friend of mine, Chris Placitella in New Jersey. Uh, Chris started interviewing, interviewed her father and learned that he had been working for this asbestos company in the lab and asked him about asbestos. And he said, well, yeah, of course, we had a lot of asbestos in it. Said, well, where are all those documents? He said, well, one day we got a memo from this law firm that told us to put all of our research outside the door. And they went by and they collected all the research after the litigation started and it just was never seen of or heard of again. The Third Circuit, that case got dismissed by the federal judge, the Third Circuit reinstated it in uh, September of 2014. So, uh, you know, that's happening. When you, you start playing outside of the rules, uh, you know, the other side is going to start challenging you. Anybody else have a question? Um, thanks for coming and talking to us. Uh, I had two questions. One was a follow-up on the Ecuador case, and um, the the first what about that was: Do you think that um, the plaintiff's lawyer was actually not doing anything wrong, and that um, they went after him for no reason? Well, I think it's a complicated answer. I think that um, you know, for for the law students, you you've heard about harmless error, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, when a case is decided by the trial court and it goes on appeal, the appellate court looks at an issue and says, well, okay, this was not done properly, but it's harmless error, so we're not going to change the, the decision. Um, the cultures and the practices and the standards in different countries are different. So where we think it's taboo to have an ex parte communication with a judge here, it's not. It's not a violation of the rules there, and even if it is, it was considered harmless error. The Supreme Court of Ecuador considered all of the claims that Texaco, or now Chevron, made about the improprieties and decided, well, okay, they probably shouldn't have done this or they shouldn't have done that, but that didn't really change the outcome. And, uh, um, and so there, there's a different set of standards and rules. Um, and that, I think, was the subject of the uh, argument uh, Deepak Gupta made in the Second Circuit on this case last spring. And, you know, he's another brilliant uh, appellate lawyer based out of Washington. Um, and, you know, I think the Second Circuit's going to take their time deciding that case. So, by our standards, did he do something wrong? Arguably. By their standards, not so much. And even if it was, the Supreme Court of Ecuador decide, decided it wasn't, it wasn't it, was, it wasn't relevant. And the other thing to remember, the way it got to Ecuador, it was brought in the United States first. And Texaco moved to dismiss it on form of convenience. The initial judge denied that motion. Then he died. The case went to a new judge. That judge reheard the motion, sent it to Ecuador. Went through the courts of Ecuador. So Chevron was right where they wanted to be. And they did not count on the government flipping in Ecuador from a very conservative, militar militaristic, right-wing government aligned with corporate industry to a more progressive, left, social-oriented government aligned with the interests of their people. So uh, Chevron, you know, got what they asked for. You, you had a second question? Yeah. In the Fifth Circuit, actually, it's required. It's called a return jurisdiction clause. And there is a, there's an en banc decision in the Fifth Circuit 
um, that I want to say, I think it's in ray air crash at New Orleans or something like that, but I'm, I'm not positive that's right. But that basically held when you're dismissing a case for form of nonconvenience because of this framework of whether there's an available alternative forum, you don't really know that until after you see whether the forum becomes available and the defendants respond to uh, <coughs> process there and so forth. So the courts have a return jurisdiction clause, so they keep the case open on their docket. And uh, if, the, if the foreign court uh, is either unable or unwilling to exercise jurisdiction, the plaintiffs can petition the U.S. court to resume jurisdiction under this return jurisdiction clause. So it is common, but uh, unless you're really well versed in this area of jurisprudence, you're not going to know that. And so a lot of lawyers who have dealt with these cases and dealt with form of comedians haven't really been equipped to respond uh, to the motions, to make the records they need to make, to bring in the experts they need to bring in, and, and it's frankly very expensive to develop, to develop the record. Anybody else? <clears throat> we, know, we know you had an internship in Latin America while you were in law school, but what did you go work with Fred Barron? Um, so I, I worked in, I worked, I lived and worked in Costa Rica before I went to law school and, and you know, learned, you know, passable Spanish while I was there. My, my, my great failure was I had an English speaking girlfriend, so it was a big mistake. But um, no, I studied Spanish for a year there in an immersion program and I worked at the court on a daily basis and, uh, and then I came back uh, actually landed in Austin and uh, I then went to law school and uh, uh, I learned a lot from Fred Barron through just I don't know for lack of a better term osmosis you know being around him and going to depositions with him going to hearings with him being in negotiations with him and seeing how he did things. I mean, he was a real master of his craft. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, very fortunate to, to, to be able to tag along. So I learned a lot there. Was I learned. Associate in his firm? I was an associate in his firm. And uh, <coughs> uh, thought long and hard about staying because I was. Uh, uh, about to become a partner and then decided that I had an opportunity to go out and do my own thing and control my own destiny and I decided I would do that and that brought me to Austin. Um, and that was, you know, 1993 when this litigation was just getting started. I think a lot of it is intuition and judgment and, you know, listening to people, listening to the people that ran the NGOs, for example, listening to the labor organizers about what uh, people in their communities cared about um, and you know the, the cultures are very different I mean I'll give you a real stark example uh, uh, I was handling a, a mesothelioma case against a Japanese company and I went to Japan uh, to meet with lawyers over there and I spoke to a, a, a ban asbestos meeting there it was a, a conference um, and the lawyers there and, and the plaintiffs, for that matter, had a very different orientation about what was important, or a different set of priorities about what was important. In our system, we want the, the person who's harmed and their family to be compensated, because that, from our standpoint, is the best way that we know how to uh, uh, try to right the wrong to the extent that you can. Obviously, you can't undo someone's death, right? But in Japan, the Japanese who were affected by asbestos disease the same way they were here, especially workers who were working at U.S. naval shipyards in Okinawa, for example, were not interested in getting compensation from the manufacturers, even if the manufacturers were prepared to pay it. They were interested in holding the government accountable for allowing it to happen. So, you know, uh, understanding that, talking to people that can help you appreciate the difference in cultures and being open-minded to it 
is important. I think that's how I learned a lot of what I do. And I think a lot of the mistakes of other lawyers who have been involved in uh, litigation on behalf of foreign nationals overlook that. Thank you to both of you for Terry Gross, I mean, <laughs> Natalie Davidson, and uh, um, Scott for sharing so much of the story, which, as you say, is so much about procedure. Um, so it's been 23 years. Do you, what do you, what do you explain to the plaintiffs along the way in terms of what's happening? You know, it's very hard to help. I mean, I can't understand it, so I can't, I mean, it's really hard to explain to a guy who was you know, 30 or 35 when this started, and now he's in his 60s. And um, uh, you know, it's just the the defendants have managed to uh, uh, you know uh, unfurl strategies that have uh, caused delay after delay after delay, procedural history. And you know, just when we thought we, you know, we we make a great step forward, we go two steps back. In Delaware, we had a case uh, where a very conservative, business-oriented state district judge who had, was the senior judge on the, on the Delaware bench, very well regarded. Um, and the defendants came in with their whole dog and pony show about why these, this was forum shopping and it was, you know, manipulation by the plaintiffs and all that. And I was pleasantly surprised because he hammered them for all the machinations that they had pursued over the last uh, uh, 20 years, really, that was in 2012, um, uh, to, to avoid having to answer these cases on the merits. And uh, took them the task and then, you know, he retired and the new judge who took it just kicked the cases out on some, you know, incoherent ruling. So it just is, uh, uh, it's frustrating. You try to explain that to the workers. We've, I think, gone uh, to great lengths to try and find a forum for them to tell their story. And, you know, now it's in the hands of the Third Circuit on Bonk. We'll see what they say. Anybody else? Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, now, t taking into consideration the, the, the challenges that you have faced in, and others have faced in achieving justice in, in context of human rights violations by corporations abroad, the states where they are uh, based, um, uh, taking into consideration the fact that the U.S. is one of the few states that has a procedure, uh, an, an act to deal with these cases. Uh, many other states, uh, investor states, do not have that, that sort of procedure. Uh, some states recently, including um, mm -hmm. Ecuador and South Africa, proposed the, the UN Human Rights Council, uh, the elaboration of a binding instrument uh, which could uh, make possible the prosecution of corporations for investments abroad. Uh, their there's the states where they're domiciled uh, in order to bring justice to those cases. I don't know if you're aware if, of that um, proposal and if you would favor the idea of generating uh, from an hum international human rights perspective a binding instrument which could allow for global investments which are increasing uh, uh, nowadays uh, um, mechanisms to enable justice and at least in gross human rights violations. Well, I, I'm not familiar with that particular proposal, but I'm always in favor of anything that's going to level the playing field between individuals and, and corporate misconduct because corporations are driven by sort of amoral goals of financial gain. Uh, and, and that's, you know, what's such a, um, you know, it's so ironic that you know, corporations are given all these rights of in humans and individuals, but they don't really have the soul uh, that goes with that. And so uh, I'm in favor of anything that would 
level the playing field. I believe that you know the civil justice system and our core to the great uh, equalizer. You know, so you know that's where any one of you can go in and take on Chevron or or Dow Chemical and uh, arguably you know be uh, on a reasonably level playing field and hold them accountable if they uh, if, if they're if they're if they're responsible for misconduct um, you know I've watched with some alarm the uh, Alien Tort Claim Act be fairly gutted by the uh, current Supreme Court and uh, it's troubling because I think that you know for people who want to talk about original intent and so forth that they really have undermined the original tent, intent of that act and you know I'd like to see it restored with some more vitality and be more robust so that when uh, you know human rights violators uh, take refuge in the United States they're, they're not uh, able to evade justice. Anybody else? Were there points in this 30-year history of litigation where, I don't know, maybe you wrapped up one of the cases and thought, well, that's that. I have to let this go now. I can't, I can't keep working on this issue. Uh, and if um, so, what kept you working? A lot of lawyers have felt that. And, um, you know, that's my Achilles heel is that I'm so stubborn <laughs> and principled. It really is. Um, I probably should have, you know, dropped this many times before. And you know, I, I, it came to a very uh, difficult point a few years ago where at where one time when we got into the litigation, the defendants were willing to compensate anybody who had, could document exposure, uh, even if they had as many as four children prior to exposure, because it was common in these, many of these communities to have seven, eight, or nine children. That was the norm. Um, as the litigation became more uh, uh, acrimonious, or maybe that's not the right word, but more uh, demanding, it became evident that the mm -hmm. only cases that we were really going to be able to prevail on are the ones that we could get to court and go to trial on. And it, just from a strategic standpoint, I was not going to spend the same amount of money prosecuting a case for someone that had four children as I would for someone who had no children and whose wife had left him because he couldn't father children. Uh, and so we had to drop many, many cases uh, that just were not going to meet the more rigid criteria that we had to come to terms with. Um, but yeah, there were many occasions where, you know, I wonder why I didn't get out when I'm getting was good, you know. Well, I, you know, I think that's really confounded Gibson Dunn and <laughs> Vincent Elkins as well. Um, uh, look, we have extraordinary talents in Rebecca Weber and Sean Lyons and our staff and our co-counsel. Jonathan Massey is a brilliant uh, legal issues lawyer and, you know, he and I met in 1996 when this litigation was just getting off the ground in terms of the appellate wars. Uh, he was a young lawyer who had uh, just finished clerking for Justice William Brennan and uh, you know, I was pursuing this and trying not to become the sequel to a civil action. You know? and, uh, uh, and I think that w we've just been really smart about how we attack the legal issues and how we're, we try to be strategic and build on economies of scale, and um, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'll have to think about it. <laughs> yeah. um, are you been keeping track of hours so you can ask for attorney's fees? No. <laughs> I do, you know, um, I think it would be depressing if I did that, <laughs> you know, because uh, I'd probably be earning about $3 an hour when all this is said and done, if I'm lucky. Um, you know, that's, that's uh, 
that, that's a double-edged sword in a plaintiff's practice. There's a lot of uh, smart business management reasons to keep track of your time for, you know, to see where you're spending it. How long is one thing taking you versus another? Um, what did you earn on this type of case versus that type of case based on your hourly time? Um, but it's also a, a kind of ball and chain that I think lawyers hate more than anything is, is the demands of keeping time. And so we haven't done that. We made a decision to you know, represent our clients on a contingent fee basis and uh, you know, will you know, reap the rewards such as they are if they ever materialize uh, when they do. But it's a good, good question and um, it's probably not a bad idea. I thought maybe we could uh, leave off here and have some time for people with students or other members of the audience want to come up and ask sure. you yeah, sure. and your colleagues some questions. Sure. I would just ask uh, one more question. If there are students in here who are aspiring lawyers and who want to get involved in this kind of litigation, this kind of career, what would you advise them to do? Go to business school. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I think that y the first thing you need to do is learn to just be a really good lawyer. Um, and you learn that by having to do things. You, you know, you don't, you, look, I get the allure of big firms and big paychecks. I really do. I mean, I, you know, initially found myself right after I, my, I, I clerked for a federal judge in the Northern District of Texas. and. Uh, you know, followed the galloping herds to Aiken Gump, but I was there six months when I realized it was a horrible mistake. And I got out of there within two months after that. Um, I think that uh, there's a big allure to uh, wanting uh, uh, that paycheck because of the burden and the stress of loans and so forth. I mean, it's just a vicious cycle. I get it. Um, I think that but when you get there, you think you're going to get really good training, and you're really not. I mean, I, I, that's my opinion. Uh, and, and that's one of the ways that we beat these lawyers, because we're just better than they are. <laughs> and, you know, they think they're better than anybody, and then they, you know, keep losing. So, um, uh, I, I would say, you know, Learn to write clearly. Learn about uh, uh, you know handling yourself on your feet. Whether you go to an improv class, like one of my, my law partners has done that, um, you know, go to trial advocacy schools. Uh, keep learning. Keep keep challenging yourself to do things uh, if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, you know, work in the public interest community for a while. Uh, and then uh, find a way to transition into the plaintiff's practice. But, you know, unfortunately, Texas is really kind of a, um, a barren place for that. The, between the legislature and the conservative uh, orientation of the courts, they have eviscerated uh, what was a very long tradition of a robust civil justice system that uh, was available to, to workers and uh, wealthy alike. And uh, so, you know, you may need to pursue that in other states. California, New Mexico, Illinois are all really good states that have, still have good, robust uh, plaintiffs, uh, tort systems. So, uh, you know, I would look to get on with a, a, a firm that is doing the kind of work that you want to do. Um, and uh, whatever you do, learn to do it well. Well, thank you very much. Um, so Scott will still be around here for another at least 10 minutes if anybody wants to come up and ask questions or talk.